section 9.4, parametric equations. So let's start with this definition, which will motivate everything else we talk about in this section. And so it says we have two continuous functions on an interval, f of t and g of t, uh, taken as a pair, that is together, we'll say that these two equations form a set of parametric equations in the plane. The set of xy points that are generated by these two equations, and of course when I say generated, I mean as t varies over the interval i, there will be xy ordered pairs generated by these two equations. One of the equations gives the x-coordinate, the other equation gives the y-coordinate. When I generate all possible points from those two equations as t varies over this interval i, we'll call this the graph of this set of parametric equations. Taken together, the two equations, the graph they produce, and the interval that was used to produce them is called a plane curve. Okay, let's start with a really simple example. It's the typical one that almost every calculus book would start with uh, to give us an idea what this is all about. We'll look at this pair of equations. x equals cosine t, y equals sine t. So as we talk through this, let's get all the, the concept and the lingo down. First of all, when I list a pair of parametric equations, I never have just one. They come together as a pair. There's one for x, one for y. Both of those are functions of a third variable, which is normally t. And that third variable, let's call that the parameter. So when we talk about parametric equations, it's that third variable on which x and y depend that we're calling the parameter. Okay, what else do I need? Well, it says I need two equations, both functions of the same variable t, but I also need an interval. So out here next to the equations, I have to specify some interval on which these two functions are defined, some t interval. And so for this example, let's say t is on the interval 0, 2 pi. So I could write it that way, or I could say t is in the interval 0 to 2 pi if I wanted to write it with interval notation. Alright, so we've got our pair of equations. My parameter is t. I've defined an interval for that parameter. Okay, so the next thing is, what's the graph look like? Well, we know that, of course, with these two equations, x squared plus y squared would be cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. So, of course, that tells us what we're actually looking at is the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, which we know is the unit circle. And, of course, we know that's correct because when we think about the unit circle, we know that points on that unit circle have coordinates that are identified by the cosine of theta and the sine of theta if that angle of inclination is theta. So really we're saying that in these equations t is playing the role of theta. And as t varies from 0 to 2 pi, we know that we trace out a circle, a unit circle, and we also know that it starts at the point 1, 0, because that's the point we're sitting at when t is 0. And then we know that that circle is traced out counterclockwise. And when we go from 0 to 2 pi, that is, if theta is going from 0 to 2 pi, we're tracing out one full rotation of that circle. So let's put that all together and just be clear about what we've got here. These two equations, along with this interval, gives me what? It gives me the graph of a circle, but you notice it does something more than that. It also tells me a starting point and an ending point. And of course, in this case, the starting and end point, end point are the same. And what else does it give me? It gives me an orientation. 
That is, not only do I know the graph is this closed circle, but I also know that if I was tracking movement around that circle, that is, as t was increasing, if I watched what points were being plotted, I see that this curve would be traced by following that circle in a counterclockwise orientation. Okay, notice that this equation, which we got just by taking these two and squaring them and adding them together and observing that that just gives us the standard Pythagorean identity cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, I would call this equation a rectangular equation. Rectangular, the word I'm using there, is to distinguish from the two parametric equations. Notice a rectangular equation, which is what we're used to do, using, that is one that defines y implicitly as a function of x, um, has no t in it. And so notice that when I graph x squared plus y squared equals 1, um, I know the graph is a circle, but nothing in that equation specifies a starting point or a direction of travel that I'll follow to trace out that curve. So now we've stumbled on the biggest difference between so-called rectangular equations and so-called parametric equations. Rectangular equation will give me the graph, that is just the physical graph, but parametric equations tell me more. They tell me a place to start, a place to stop, and an orientation or direction of travel. And this is really the power of parametric equations. Okay, there's one other thing that parametric equations tell us. So let's look at another example just to see that. In fact, let's pick this example. Uh, whoops, let's make that cosine of 2t and sine of 2t. And let's stay on that interval 0 to 2 pi. Now, of course, I, I know that cosine squared of 2t plus sine squared of 2t is still 1. So that means this is still x squared plus y squared equals 1. That means if I ask what is the graph of this set of parametric equations, what is the physical graph, it's still the unit circle. Okay, but the question is, is the orientation the same? Where do I start? Well, for that, we can always use the brute force method of plotting points. If I don't have a clear idea of what the, the graph's orientation is or where the starting point is, well, let's just figure those things out. So for various values of t on the interval 0 to 2 pi, I could actually compute x and y separately. And so I might try 0. Uh, if I'm going around the circle 0 to 2 pi and I'm thinking of t as theta, well, then I might think of pi over 2. I might think of pi. I might think of 3 pi over 2. I might think of 2 pi if I was just going to divide it up into quarter turns. Let's see, when you put in 0, you're going to get cosine of 0, which is 1, and sine of 0, which is 0. When you plug in pi over 2, then because of that 2 in the argument, uh, when I plug in pi over 2, I'm actually going to get cosine of pi, which is negative 1, and I'm going to get sine of pi, which is 0. When I plug in pi, I'm going to get cosine of 2 pi, which is 1, and I'm going to get sine of 2 pi, which is 0. All right, so think about that. Uh, when I plug in t equals 0, I'm sitting right there. When I plug in pi over 2, I'm sitting right here. When I plug in pi, I'm actually back at 1, 0 again. So if this is somehow uh, giving me a path for the travel around the unit circle, then it looks like in a time interval of 0 to 2 pi, it looks like we've traversed the circle one full revolution. All right, that should make sense to you because you recall the old fact about sinusoids. If you have something like a sine of at, you know that the period of that sinusoid is 2 pi over a. 
and in this case a is 2 so that means the period of this guy should be 2 pi over 2 which is pi okay meaning I would have one full cycle of both the cosine graph and the sine graph in 0 to 2 pi or 0 to pi rather and I did mean to write pi here not 2 pi which means I'm going around the circle one full time one full revolution in 0 to pi okay notice in the example I gave you these two equations on the interval 0 to 2 pi okay then what is this plane curve doing well it's a circle but if I'm thinking of it a little deeper in terms of let's say a particle moving around that graph then what we actually have here is motion around a circle but clearly it's going around once and then twice that is it's going around this circle once once from 0 to pi and then as t varies from pi to 2 pi it goes around the circle a second time all right so what is the the extra thing we've added here parametric equations also measure or give you a way to track let's say the speed of an object or a point as it moves along this parametric curve so what I mean by that is if I compare this curve with the one we just did on the previous page which was just the plane x equals cosine t y equals sine t over that same interval and now if you if it makes it convenient to think of that as time we're saying on the interval of time 0 to 2 pi this set of parametric equations gave us a circle that was oriented counterclockwise and we made one revolution this set of parametric equations on the same interval gives us the same curve that is the same physical curve but a different plane curve because a plane curve is the physical curve put together with the interval and also the equations which describe speed and obviously what we're saying is going around this circle twice is a different plane curve than going around this once a plane curve is more than just the physical curve it's how a point would be traced or how that curve would be traced as t varies over this interval all right so what do we have now plane curves give us more than just the physical curve they also give us the orientation that is the direction of travel and they also give us speed that is if we compare two sets of parametric equations that describe the same physical curve are those two physical curves being traced out the same way um, they could have different orientations they could have different speeds okay let's look at one more let's take our same example we've been using with the unit circle uh, let's switch the sine and the cosine around and again if I was just uh, loosely trying to figure out what's going on here I might try some t values to see what x and y are doing when I plug in 0 of course I'm going to get sine of 0 and cosine of 0 when I plug in pi over 2 I'm going to get sine of pi over 2 cosine pi over 2 I plug in pi I'm going to get sine of pi cosine of pi I plug in 3 pi over 2 I'm going to get sine of pi I'm going to get I'm sorry sine of 3 pi over 2 which is negative 1 and cosine of 3 pi over 2 which is 0 and if I swing back around to 2 pi then of course we're back at sine of 2 pi is 0 cosine of 2 pi is 1 and let's add here that I left out the interval which again I want to be 0 to 2 pi alright what's happening this time well I know this is still a circle where am I starting this time though because remember that these parametric equations also prescribe a starting point well when t is 0 
and I do start at that left end of the interval, I'm sitting at the point 0, 1, which means I'm right here. Okay, when you increase to pi over 2, uh, where do you land? You land at 1, 0. Okay, where's 1, 0? It's here. Okay, so what did I do as t increased from 0 to pi over 2? I went from this point to this point. That seems to suggest that I'm doing a clockwise rotation. Now you should notice the period of these trig, trig functions is 2 pi. So if I'm going to rotate around the circle, this is going to be one rotation with these equations. But I've definitely altered the starting point and the orientation. The orientation has been reversed to clockwise, and instead of starting at the usual 1, 0, I'm now starting at 0, 1. Now, what's, what's another way that you can sort of uh, verify this or justify this? I could look at dx dt and dy dt. Okay, notice for these equations, dx dt would be cosine t and dy dt would be negative sine t. Okay, think about that interval um, 0 to pi over 2. On the interval 0 to pi over 2, what can you say about cosine t? Well, it's positive. What can you say about negative sine t? It's negative on that same interval. So what does that verify? Well, it says that as t increases from 0 to pi over 2, your dx dt is positive. And your dy dt is negative. Okay, what does that really say? This one says that as t increases, x increases. And this one says that as t increases, y decreases. Well, that means if x is increasing and y is decreasing, that you're moving to the right and you're moving down. That definitely verifies or is consistent with what we're thinking when we look at this table up here. That is, if I start at the point 0, 1 and I land at the point 1, 0, uh, this confirms that my x coordinate must really be getting bigger and my y coordinate must be getting smaller. That means I have to be going down the circle this way. Okay, so put all that together. And what I would graph for this set of parametric equations is a unit circle with a starting point at 0, 1. And I'd want to be sure to include arrows on my graph, like I did in the previous examples, that show what the orientation is. So in all the examples you'll see in the book, and when you do the problems in the book, you'll want to put arrows on your graphs just to so show which way the orientation is. In the case of a circular graph, it's going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, let's do another quick example. Let's get away from the circles a little bit. Let's say we have the set of parametric equations x equals t squared minus 4 and y equals t over 2. And let's say we're on the interval negative 2 to 3, so the closed interval, negative 2 to 3. Okay, it's always nice when it's a closed interval because it means if I want to make a table to see what's going on with x and y, I can definitely start with that starting value of t and end with that ending value of t. And in fact, it might be convenient just to evaluate at all the integers between negative 2 and 3, just to get a feel for what's happening with x and y. So of course, uh, let's if I look at negative 1 and 0 and 1 and 2 and 3, then we could just compute these to see what we get. And I'll let you uh, check my numbers here. Uh, if I plug in negative 2, I should get 0. If I plug in negative 2 for y, I should get negative 1. Uh, if I plug in negative 1, I'll get negative 3. 
and negative one half. If I plug in zero, I'll get negative four and zero. If I plug in one, I'll get negative three and one half. If I plug in two, I'll get zero and one. If I plug in three, I'll get negative one and three halves. Okay, now if I plot those points, so let's see, uh, the points we're talking about, of course, are these guys. So let's see, 0, negative 1 would be here. Negative 3, negative 1 half, so 1, 2, 3, and maybe right about there. Negative 4, 0, right about there. Negative 3, 1 half. That would be right there. 0, 1 would be here. And by the way, that should have been 1 right there, shouldn't it? I don't know why I put a negative there. Should have been 1, um, but it will actually be. Well, actually, I guess I can't square properly. How about, we, uh, how about we call that 5? When I put 3 into this equation, I should get 9 minus 4. So it jumps way out to 5, 3 halves. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then up to 1 and a half. So maybe right about here somewhere. OK, of course. You know, this makes sense if I see that quadratic in the x equation and then I see the overall profile of this set of points. Uh, if I think about connecting the dots, then it certainly makes me think, you know, the graph might be a parabola. Now, if that's true, which it is, notice that because of the interval I've used along with these parametric equations, the graph is not the entire parabola. It's just this piece. That is the piece that starts at 0, negative 1 and ends at 5, 3 halves. There's clearly an orientation indicated here, too. It's the orientation that makes the graph get traced out that way. Now, again, what else could I do to make this graph better or to be more sure about what I've got here? I could certainly plot more points, just like with any graphing you've ever done before. The more points, the better. Uh, but again, the other thing I could do is use this technique of taking the individual derivatives with respect to t to get a sense of which direction the x and y are moving individually. So in this case, if I looked at dx dt, which would be 2t, and I looked at dy dt, which would be 1 half, well, of course, right away I look at that dy dt and I see that that's always positive. Okay, and that tells me what? That y is always increasing everywhere. Okay, and that makes sense. It definitely tells me that my orientation for this graph could not possibly be this way. If it was, my y would have to be decreasing, and clearly that's not the case. All right, what else? Well, when I look at the dx dt, I see the derivative there is 2t, and the sign of that just depends on whether t is less than 0 or greater than 0. Well, of course, I know that this is going to be positive if t is greater than 0, and it's going to be negative if t is less than 0. And that makes sense. Between t equals negative 2 and 0, we're on this part of the graph. And on that part of the graph, dx dt is negative because x is decreasing. Then if t is between 0 and 3, then my derivative is negative, or I'm sorry, my derivative is positive, which makes sense because between t equals 0 and t equals 3, I'm on this part of the graph, which means my x must be moving to the right. So using a table in conjunction with these derivatives will definitely lock down the orientation for you. Okay, for our next example,
let's try this one. So we want x equals 1 over the square root of t plus 1. And we want y to be t over t plus 1. On the interval, negative 1 to infinity, open at negative 1. All right, so first of all, the, the, the first thing you should notice is that we don't actually have a starting t value. The lower bound on the interval is negative 1, but we never actually reach that t value. Now, what would happen if I plugged t equals negative 1 into these? Well, they're clearly both undefined. But I could certainly ask, what is the limit, let's say, as t approaches negative 1 from the right, of 1 over the square root of t plus 1? And what is the limit as t approaches negative 1 from the right of t over t plus 1? And in the case of this one, I can see that as t approaches negative 1 from the right, this denominator approaches 0 through positive values, and the top is a positive constant, which means this limit should be positive infinity. For this bottom limit, as t approaches negative 1 from the right, again, the denominator approaches 0 through positive values, and the top will approach a negative constant limit of negative 1. Okay, that means when I put those two together, this limit should be negative infinity. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that as I approach the left endpoint of that interval from the right, it simply means that my x will be getting very, very large, and my y will be getting more and more negative. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that on this end of the interval, I have to be out here somewhere, where x is very, very large, and y is very, very negative. Okay, so then it might be natural to ask about the other end of the interval, which again is another open end, and it's an infinity. So I can ask those same questions. I can't actually plug in infinity, but I can ask what's the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over the square root of t plus 1, and what's the limit as x approaches infinity of t over t plus 1, and of course this first one is going to be 0, and this second one is going to be 1. Okay, now, since I'm approaching infinity, it means I, I just keep getting bigger and bigger, these limits say what? The bigger t gets, the closer and closer these two functions will take me to the limiting position of 0, 1. That is the point 0, 1. So if I'm going to graph this, I'm going to put a dot there at 0, 1, but not a closed dot, because I know I'm never actually going to get there. But I do know that as t increases, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, these two parametric equations should be leading me towards that point. Now, how are they going to be leading me that, to that point? Well, from somewhere down here. Because the other end of the interval says as t is, when t is close to negative 1, my x value is very big and my y value is very negative. So I'm conjecturing now that we're following some path that starts way down here. And when I say starts, I don't really mean starts at a point. I mean there's a tail there. And then somehow I'm going to lead up toward that location of 0, 1 where the hole is. Now, question, if that's the case, what should that mean about dx dt and dy dt? And this is how I can verify that uh, my conjecture about the orientation is correct here. Well, if I'm moving from down here to this point, it means my x is decreasing and my y is increasing. x is moving to the left and y is moving up. That means dx dt should be negative and dy dt should be positive. And so if those are both true, then what I'm conjecturing here about the orientation of this curve would seem correct. Okay, let's check that real quickly. Um, what's dx dt? 
Of course, that's just the derivative with respect to t of t plus 1 to the negative 1 half, which would be negative 1 half t plus 1 to the negative 3 halves. Or in other words, negative 1 over 2 times the square root of t plus 1 cubed. And I know that that is clearly negative for all t in the integral negative 1 to infinity. Okay, that means this that we were guessing is correct. And let's just verify the other one quickly. dy dt, uh, that would be derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared, which would be 1 over t plus 1 squared, which is clearly positive on the interval negative 1 to infinity. Okay, that confirms the other part of what we thought must happen. Okay, now, that's great. We, we definitely have a good sense of the orientation now. What I don't have a sense of is what the shape or appearance of this curve is, the physical curve. And for that, uh, we're using this example to take us to the next important idea, which I'll say is eliminating the parameter. Now, I'll just say that you're not always able to do this. This is not something that always works, although it will work for most of the functions you'll see here in the textbook. Okay, what do I mean by eliminating the parameter? Well, number one, I would ask, is it possible to solve either of these equations, either the x equation or the y equation, for t. And if you look at these two equations, uh, the answer is yes. They can both be solved for t in terms of x and y, respectively. Um, if it is possible, so if yes, then solve for t in one of the equations, and then just simply substitute for t in the other equation. And of course that should make perfect sense to you. That seems like the standard substitution technique we would use if we were solving a system of two equations. I would solve one equation for one variable in terms of the other and then substitute into the other equation. Usually we're used to doing that with, let's say, two equations with two unknowns. Now we have two equations with three variables. So that means what? If I can solve one of these equations for, let's say, t in terms of x, maybe, then I could substitute that t in terms of x into the t in the other equation, which would turn all of that stuff into an expression that involves only x. Okay, what would that give me? It would give me some sort of rectangular equation that involves only x and y, which means I've eliminated the parameter t. All right, we know that rectangular equations aren't much good for figuring out orientation or starting points or things like that, but they're very useful for getting the basic physical graph. They're, they're what we're used to using and they're much more informative usually when it comes to actually determining shapes of graphs that we're used to, and that, that we know. So in this case, the answer is yes, we can solve both of these equations for t. I'm going to pick one, so let me erase all this. Magic eraser, skipped ahead. Uh, I could solve either one of these for t. I'm just going to pick this one, the first one. It doesn't really matter, but let's go with that one. Uh, if I squared both sides, I could get rid of that square root on the right side. And then I could just say t plus 1 equals 1 over x squared. So that means t equals 1 over x squared minus 1. Notice, interestingly, that your other function, that is the one you're going to substitute into, contains a t plus 1. 
and t plus 1 just happens to be 1 over x squared. All right, so if I substitute this for t in the other equation, i.e. the x equals, I'm sorry, the y equals t over t plus 1 equation, that would give me what? It would say that y is equal to t, which is 1 over x squared minus 1, over t plus 1, which we said right here was 1 over x squared. Uh, notice that if I multiply top and bottom by x squared, um, I actually get 1 minus x squared. So I have eliminated the parameter and produced a rectangular equation. I know that rectangular equation describes the graph of this set of parametric equations. It won't tell me orientation, starting point, and those details. But that's OK. I already figured those out. I know what y equals 1 minus x squared looks like. That's just a standard inverted parabola shifted up 1. So of course, it looks like this. Well badly drawn, but you get the idea. All right, now, I know the actual parametric graph is not that entire graph. In fact, I already have a pretty good guess of what it should be. And if it makes sense to you, it definitely should not be this part of the graph. It should be the right side of the parabola with that as the terminating location or the limiting location. And the orientation should be this way. In other words, if I put that all together, I think what we're saying is our graph should look like this. And I'll just use blue here to make some arrows that go up like this to show the orientation. And that is the graph of this set of parametric equations. So again, I use this idea of eliminating the parameter to get myself a more useful equation so I knew what the basic graph was. And then I'm using my information from the set of parametric equations to figure out what are the limiting positions at both ends of this infinite interval, which is open at negative 1. We figured out that those locations were infinitely far down here in quadrant 4 and then 0, 1 for my limiting location at the upper end. And of course, don't forget that we also did use our derivatives at one point just to verify that the orientation really is what we thought it was. OK, so now at some point, you're going to want to use a graphing utility uh, I'm all for learning the fundamentals and knowing how to do the basics. But at a certain point, the functions get, get beyond us. And so we need to know how to use a graphing utility. There are many things you could use if you have a graphing calculator like a TI-83 or 84. Those are certainly capable of this. Uh, GeoGebra is pretty good. Um, GeoGebra is the one I use quite a lot, along with a, a program that's called Graph. Uh, but actually, I'm going to use Desmos here to demo this because Desmos is freely available. I think most of you are familiar with it. It's browser-based. Um, it actually turns out to be very useful for parametric equations. So if I go to desmos.com, um, in the left panel there, you can insert functions. And so I've got some examples worked out, but let's let's say I wanted to graph that circle example in the beginning, just that straight x equals cosine t, y equals sine t on the interval 0 to 2 pi. So let me uh, just give you a quick demo how to do that. So if I come down here, I'm just tapping to create a new function. Now, if you wanted to graph regular functions like y equals f of x, then that's how you type things in in here. Uh, but how do you type in parametric equations? Well, since parametric equations are x, y ordered pairs, really, then when I go to enter a parametric equation, I'm going to enter it with a pair of parentheses. So I start and open left parenthesis, 
and I type in my x and y parametric functions in terms of t. That's the variable that this system understands. So in this case, I would simply type in cosine t, comma, sine t. And of course, it already has the closed parentheses for you. Notice down below, it's already created an interval for you. Uh, you can tap on those entries and change those upper and lower limits for the interval. Notice, of course, right now it defaults to 0, 1, which obviously starts me at t equals 0, and that 1 would definitely be 1 radian. Okay, that's clearly not all the way around, so I'll just tap on that upper limit, and I'll change that to 2 times pi. Except I left out the 2 for some reason. Let's try that again. 2 times pi. Okay, and there's my graph. Now, notice what's missing here. What's missing is I don't see the orientation because I can't see how the graph is traced. It's really just giving me the physical graph. Okay, the way to fix that is let's go back to where we were typing. And notice that when I started typing the function, the instant I typed in a variable, it gave me this option right below to add a slider. So instead of continuing to type comma and then the y function, let's tap on that add slider. And when I do, it produces another entry just below with a slider. And of course, we'll be able to change that in a minute. Right now, it's adding a slider that I can man manipulate from t equals negative 10 to t equals 10. That's the default. So if I go back up here to my parametric pair, and I go ahead and finish typing out the y function, which is cosine t. Well, how about sine t? Okay, now I've got my parametric functions in there. And notice now if I move the slider, I can definitely see the profile there. I'm definitely doing counterclockwise rotation around a circle. Now, if I hold down, I can change that to 0 and 2 times pi. You can even prescribe a step size, meaning when you move the slider, it will move slower as you move the slider. If you make the step size smaller, uh, it will produce very jagged movement if you make the step size too large. So I usually do something like, uh, I think the default step size is, is fine, but uh, I'm going to do something like, let's say, 0 0.0001. That's just overkill, but I usually do some ridiculously small step size. And of course, now when I tap out of there, I have this slider. And you can see I've slowed it down now, and it's definitely doing one rotation of the circle. Okay, now, with Desmos, you can have the best of both worlds. Notice up at the top, I've already created something for you here. In this first box right here, let me get rid of this one. Okay, I quickly changed a couple of things there. In the first box, I have cosine t sine t on that basic interval 0 to 2 pi. And notice if I click on that, there's our physical circle. Now, of course, here's the thing. I can't use the same variable to have two different entries, one for the physical curve and one for the animation that shows the tracing of the curve. So to get around that, just create a second entry and use a different variable. Uh, you can use anything you want. Uh, if you look at the example below, you can see that I've done it with u. So this system understands more than just t. Uh, when you begin typing in the cosine s, the instant you type the s after the cosine, the system will recognize that s is the argument of your cosine function. It will interpret that and define it as a variable. It will give you the option to create a slider. 
So I went ahead and took that option and created the slider. And so now you notice I have two entries. This first one is producing the physical curve. It has traced out the curve for those parametric equations on the entire interval 0 to 2 pi. On this next entry, I reproduce that same cosine and sine pair of functions, but with s as the variable. And then I've created a slider where I've let s go from 0 to 2 pi. And you can see now that I can see both the particle that represents the tracing of the curve, and I can watch it in real time, and I can watch it go around the actual curve. And so if I put that all together, I've got the physical curve, I've got the starting point, I've got the ending point, I have the orientation or direction of tracing. So this is a useful technique of creating basically the same function in two different entries, but use two, two different variables. In one entry, just create a fixed interval, which is the interval that goes with your parametric equations. That's the one I'm doing here. And then in the second entry, well, if I can get it turned back on. In the second entry, create those that pair of parametric, parametric functions again with a different variable, and this time create a slider for that variable over that same interval. Run these two at the same time, and you've got the physical curve and an animation that you can either manipulate manually or press the play button to watch it animate at different speeds. Okay, so that makes Desmos just about one of the best uh, and most easily available tools for looking at graphs of parametric functions. So I want to use Desmos to look at one more example uh, just to see how we can use what we've learned about our, our hand approach to these things using the derivatives and using tables and using what we know about graphs of rectangular functions along with Desmos to figure out what the graph of a, a slightly more complicated one might look like. Uh, let's, let's actually do two more examples. Let's do one easy one, and then we'll do one that's, that's a little harder. Actually, let me correct that. We've just got one more example. I already did the, the other one I was thinking of a minute ago. So let's talk about this last example, uh, which is a standard one, and you'll see ones like this in your homework. Uh, let's look at x equals secant t, y equals tangent t on the interval 0 to 2 pi. All right, the, the first thing that you should be thinking about is that these functions are not continuous or even, well, not defined everywhere on that interval. All right, so what about the places where I'm not discontinuous, and where are those? Well, I know secant, which is 1 over cosine, wouldn't be defined anywhere that cosine is 0. And that would definitely happen at t equals pi over 2 and t equals 3 pi over 2. And of course, since tangent is also something that has a cosine in the denominator, tangent would have the same problem at those same two values. All right, that means what? We have an interval 0 to pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, and we're saying something bad is going to happen at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Now, even though there's a problem at those values, this does suggest to me that I am okay on the interval 0 to pi over 2 the interval pi over 2 open to 3 pi over 2 open, and then the interval 3 pi over 2 open to 2 pi closed, which means if I can figure out what's happening with the graph on each of these intervals, then I'll just put the three together in sequence and I'll get my graph. Okay, so the first thing that I should probably think about doing, and this would go for any problems any of these parametric graphing problems you see from now on, the first thing I would be thinking about is, can I eliminate the parameter? Now, there's a little twist on this one. So when we talked about eliminating the parameter before, the question was, can I solve 
one of the equations for the parameter, for t, and then substitute that into the other equation in terms of t, or in terms of that, that variable that you've solved t for. Well, I can do that because it's obviously possible to solve something like that one, let's say, for t in terms of y. And then I could certainly substitute that into the other equation, which would give me x equals secant of tan inverse of y. And we've done things like that before. We know how to draw reference triangles. And from the reference triangle, figure out what this expression is in terms of y. That's doable. Uh, but let's talk about a slightly different approach for eliminating the parameter. So there is another way to elim eliminate the parameter, and that would be to use identities, if I could spell identities, or let's say known equations. Okay, so what I mean by that is rather than try to solve one of the equations for t, let's say in terms of y, and then substitute that into the x equation to get my rectangular equation that way, is it possible to take these equations and somehow relate them or relate x and y directly to each other via some known equation that contains secant and tangent, or in this case, an identity? And of course, once I see those trig functions, my first thought is, are there any identities I can appeal to? And the first one that you should be thinking about when you say secant, when you see secant and tangent, is your standard Pythagorean. That is the one that says 1 plus tangent squared t equals secant squared t. And this is the nice thing about seeing parametric equations with trig functions. You have a host of trig identities that you might be able to pull in. In this case, this identity would simply tell me 1 plus tangent squared, which is y squared, equals secant squared, which is x squared. And I immediately recognize that as x squared minus y squared equals 1, which I know is the equation of a hyperbola. It's a hyperbola with its focal axis lying along the x-axis because the x squared term is the positive term. And so we know we're talking about our basic hyperbola that looks like this. And we're definitely saying that A and B are both 1, which means I have my little box that's 2 by 2, and that gives me my pair of slant asymptotes. And so we're definitely talking about the graph of this basic hyperbola. Now, of course, that's the easy part now that we've done the eliminating the parameter. Now the question is, what about orientation? OK, we'll look at Desmos in a minute. Uh, but first, let's use all the techniques we've, we've learned on the other examples. Uh, we could definitely start by looking at derivatives. If we look at dx dt, that would be secant t tangent t. If we looked at dy dt, uh, that would be secant squared t. Now, I like that one because right away I see that that one is positive on each of the three intervals that we're talking about up here. Okay, what does that mean? If dy dt is always positive on those intervals where these functions are defined, that means y is always increasing. That means whatever the orientation is on my graph or however this graph is being traced, I'm always going up. I'll never go down. Okay, so that leads me to the question of what is x doing? And I can see from those two functions that that depends on the quadrant. All right, now, where am I here? I am 0 to pi over 2, which means I'm in quadrant 1. And on that one, I can definitely see that dx dt is positive because secant and tangent are both positive in quadrant 1. Okay, that means I'm moving to the right when t goes from 0 to pi over 2. Now that next interval, this one, pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, actually contains two quadrants. 
So I'm going to split that into two quadrants because once I move from quadrant two to quadrant three, that may change what this guy is doing. So I'm going to look at pi over two to pi. And I'm going to look at pi to three pi over two. And actually, I don't really want to look at the closed interval at pi. I'm just looking at what happens inside the interval itself. And then, of course, I'll want to look at 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. And I can see from pi over 2 to pi, which is in quadrant 2, I know that secant is negative and tangent is also negative, which means the product is positive. That means dx dt is still positive. That means I'm still moving to the right. Next interval, pi to 3 pi over 2, that's quadrant 3. I know secant is still negative, but I know tangent is positive in quadrant 3. That means dx dt is now negative. That means I'm moving to the left. 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, that means now I'm in this interval. And in quadrant 4, secant's positive and tangent's negative, which means the product is negative. So that means dx dt is negative again, and I'm moving to the left. All right, what does that mean if I put that all together? Well, we already said that we were moving up in all four of those intervals. So I'm going right and up, then going right and up again, then left and up, then left and up. All right, so let's think about, first of all, where we're starting. What is the starting location? And that would be wherever I'm sitting when t is 0. So, of course, when I'm at 0, if I just quickly make a little table here for x and y, well, when t is 0, my x and y would be secant of 0 and tangent of 0. Secant of 0 would be 1, tangent of 0 would be 0. That means I'm starting right here at 1, 0, which note that would be this location right here. All right, now, you'll notice there's only one choice now. If I'm going to follow or trace out that hyperbola, and I know that in quadrant one, I have to be going right and up, then there is only one possibility. The first part of my graph, as t goes from zero to pi over two, has to be that part of the right branch of the hyperbola. No choice. That's the only one I could trace and trace it with my x values moving to the right and my y values going up. Now, of course, what happens as you approach pi over 2? Well, the key word there is approach. It's an open interval. So, of course, what happens to secant of theta and tangent of theta as t approaches pi over 2? They both approach infinity which means x gets bigger and y gets bigger, which is exactly what this piece of the hyperbola does. All right, so that means we've got our first part of the graph, and the orientation is like so. I need to make sure I put arrows on there to show that orientation. All right, now that leads me to the next part, which is that interval from pi over 2 to pi. All right. Again, what was the limit as t approached pi over 2? Well, for both secant and tangent, it was infinity. Okay, that means wherever this graph is coming in from for this next part, it's got to be coming from somewhere where both x and y are infinite. But be careful. If you're on this interval, let's shade this in blue. If you're on this interval, pi over 2 to pi, you have to remember that you're approaching pi over 2 from the right. And I'll leave it for you to check. If you approach pi over 2 from the right, secant of t approaches negative infinity, and tangent of t also approaches negative infinity. Okay, that means I am coming in from some infinity, that is, coming in from some tail of this graph. But where would I be coming in from? Somewhere where they're both infinitely negative. Well, there's only one place that could be coming in from. That would be down here. 
Okay, and notice what I'm supposed to be doing on this interval. I'm supposed to be going right and up. And if you think about the four places I could be in in this graph, uh, there's only one place that makes sense there, and that would be this part down here in the lower left corner. That is, if I was on this piece of the hyperbola, and I was traveling with that orientation, my x would definitely be getting bigger, that is going to the right, and my y would definitely be going up, so that means both of those are correct. Uh, where would I land? Well, that piece would land right here, which notice that's the location negative one zero, and notice that is exactly where I'll land if t is equal to pi secant of pi is negative 1, tangent of pi is 0, which means by the time I get to pi right here, I should be landing at negative 1, 0 anyway. Well, if I put that landing spot together with what this dx dt tells me, there's only one piece of this graph I could be on. It's on this lower part of the left branch of the hyperbola, and my orientation would have to be going up. All right, now, the next part should be easy to see. On that x interval, since it picks up at pi, it means I have to start at that same negative 1, 0 location where I just ended on that second interval. Well, that means the next piece has to be this. There's no choice, really. Now, is the orientation correct if I just keep going like this? Well, that would mean what? On that third piece, my dx dt would have to be negative, and my dy dt would have to be positive. In other words, I'd have to be going to the left and be going up. And that is precisely what I'm doing on that third piece. Okay, what about the fourth piece? Of course, when I go to 3 pi over 2, as I approach 3 pi over 2 from the left, uh, secant of t approaches negative infinity and tangent of t approaches positive infinity, which is why this tail out here does what it does. But on the next interval, I would be approaching 3 pi over 2 from the right. Well, when you approach 3 pi over 2 from the right, secant of t approaches positive infinity, and tangent of t approaches negative infinity, which means now I'm over here. And what am I supposed to be doing as I trace out the last part of the graph? Uh, I'm supposed to be going left and up. And notice the only part of the hyperbola that's left, which is this part, if I started down here somewhere and I traced upward and to the left to trace out this curve, my orientation would definitely have to be like this, and that would definitely be moving to the left and up which is correct. So notice what I'm doing here. I'm using a combination of a table, derivatives, uh, using what I know from eliminating the parameter about the basic shape of the graph. And then by process of elimination, I realize this really comes down to four pieces. And so again, what is the orientation? Well, just to make it explicit here, and I'll do this in green, first I traced out this part then I traced out this part, then this part, and then last this one down in quadrant four. All right, now, just for uh, full circle completion here, let's go back to Desmos, and I'll show you what this looks like in here. So again, how would I set this up? Well, you can notice here in this box right here, I've entered the parametric equations in the usual way, set of parentheses, uh, the x function comma the y function, so secant t comma tangent t. Uh, when I did that, it prompted me for the interval. I put in 0 to 2 pi. Okay, what have I done in the space below that? Well, I re-entered, um, and I don't really think those extra parentheses were necessary with the u's. Um, I'll let you try that. I don't think they are, but I probably put them in there for good measure. But you can see what I've done. I've created the pair of parametric equations again. This time I've used a different variable u. And when I was typing out secant u, when I first typed the letter u, it would have prompted me for a slider. 
I accepted that and it created that slider on the last line. Then when I completed entering the two parametric functions, I could set up the slider to run from 0 to 2 pi. And of course now when I click on that set of parametric equations, you can see here that it is giving me a purple dot at the position 0, 1. And now if I play the slider, of course it shows me exactly how the tracing happened. Now it will do a reverse. I believe you can actually change that to just forward. and You can actually slow it down also. So let's uh, that's a little too slow. And notice if you want to get out of the animation you have to take it back to that uh, bi-directional Notice I've got my slider back. I do see that it changed my values. So let me put that back at 0 and at 2 times pi. Here, I'll try and make that step size really small. So 0 0.000001. Let's see if that'll help. And it still moves pretty fast around those. Okay, but I can clearly see the orientation, and then of course it does the reverse again. But again, if you don't like the animation, just do it by hand. I can clearly see the orientation and which parts are being traced in which order. So for this reason, Desmo should, be prove, should prove pretty useful, especially on some of the ones that are a little less intuitive or you're not quite sure exactly how they're being traced out. Okay, let's close out with one last example, a very famous curve. And actually, it's connected to two problems in classical physics. Um, the, the two names for those two problems you see here, the first one is the brachistochrone, and the other problem is the totochrone problem. Uh, just a quick explanation of what each problem is about. Um, the first one, the brachistochrone, asks the question, if I had an elevated location and then a lower level, and let's say I wanted to move an object from here to here, and I wanted to construct a path along which to, let's imagine that object is a ball or a marble, and I want to construct a path along which to roll that red marble downhill to get it from, let's say, this point to this point. And of course, you realize there are a lot of ways I could do that. Uh, the simplest of which is to just make a straight ramp. But I could also make other paths. I could make paths that appear concave down, sorry that first one's concave up or concave down and of course uh, I could roll the marble along any one of those paths and the question is along all those infinitely many paths that connect A and B is there one path along which if all other factors are held equal uh, time will be minimized for the object to get from point A to point B uh, of course the the first path that many people guess is the straight ramp. That is, if I just roll the ball down the ramp, isn't that the path that will get me from A to B the quickest? That is, the path that will minimize the travel time. And the answer is no. Um, as it turns out, if that's my two, and I'll change the colors now, if that's where it starts and I'm trying to construct a path, uh, you might very well guess that some sort of concave down path might be best. And in fact, let me, uh, let me move this over a little bit to just put a little space between those. So as I said, you might guess that some sort of concave down path might be best. Uh, you might guess, of course, that if the path was very sharply decreasing, especially at the beginning, uh, that might impart some extra velocity 
to the particle when it begins to roll down the hill or down the ramp. But of course, the, the sharper I make the curve in the beginning, uh, the more I'm going to have to compensate for it later on as I approach the B point. Okay, now it does turn out, turn out that the curve, and there is one exact curve connecting these two points that will minimize that travel time, and it's called the cycloid. That is the, the name for the curve, and that's the curve we'll look at here in a minute. Uh, but it does turn out that if you give me two points in the plane at different locations, and you ask what is the curve that would connect those two points, in such a way that if I did view this as a path along which I was going to roll, let's say, that marble, where all other things were negligible, friction and so forth, then the path that would minimize the travel time is this curve we call the cycloid. Okay, now, what's the tautochrone? Okay, the tautochrone is the question or the idea of is there a curve such that again if I had a starting location and an ending location so we'll call this A and B and let's say I released my object and let it travel from A to B and I recorded the time let's say that was T1 uh, then let's say along that same path let's say I release the object from that point and so I follow its path along that same curve and of course that would be that portion of the curve in red uh, let's say I measure the time and it's T2 let's say I do it a third time I release it from a bit lower point this time uh, let's make that purple and so when I release it it falls from there down to that terminating point at B and let's say I log that time and it's T3. Okay, so the Tautochrone problem asks, is there a curve along which all three of these times would be the same, regardless of the release point for that ball? And the answer is yes, there is one unique curve that satisfies that condition, and actually it is the cycloid. So this is quite a remarkable result, uh, quite famous in mathematics and especially in physics uh, that this one curve which actually has its own very simple interpretation as we'll see, you see here in a minute actually is the solution to these two uh, very difficult problems now you do notice that in particular the Brachistochrone problem is a minimization problem it's a time minimization problem uh, but I'm not asking what value of X minimizes the value of a function, I'm asking which curve among the infinitely many choices I have that connect the points A and B minimizes the, the travel time of a ball falling from point A to point B. Okay, that's a little beyond our ability in standard calculus. Uh, so if you continue on in engineering, you may at some point, uh, especially if you're in mechanical engineering, run into this eventually. It falls under the heading of Calculus of Variations. And when you study that, you'll learn how to actually prove that the cycloid is the path that minimizes that time. All right, now, what is the cycloid? Uh, let's look at a picture of it. And actually, the uh, graph you see in black right there that looks like sort of uh, two semi-elliptical arches joined end to end that graph is the so-called cycloid. Now, I said that there was a very simple interpretation of the cycloid on its own, and here let me just animate this and you'll see. So watch the circle, the gray circle, and watch the little red dot, red point at the very bottom of the circle. So I'm going to start the animation and when I do, the gray circle is going to roll to the right at a constant speed. So when I do that, it's going to look like this. So we'll just let it go for one full turn of the wheel right there. 
and a second full term. Okay, you will notice, of course, that one full turn of that wheel, oops, sorry, one full turn of that wheel is going to happen over an interval of 2 pi. So from 0 to 2 pi, I'm getting one rotation of the wheel or of the circle. That gets me to the point we're at now. And then from 2 pi to 4 pi, that would repeat it. So obviously this is a periodic graph. The period is 2 pi. All right, now let's see if we can figure out what the parametric equations are for this graph. And let me pause it right there for a second. So one thing is for sure, as you watch it travel, you notice the center of the circle. If you keep your eye on that, the center of the circle doesn't change height. It's always, this is a circle of radius 2, so it's always 2 units high. So that means if I asked you what was the y-coordinate of the center of that circle at all times, you would say 2. Okay, if I asked you what the x-coordinate of the center of that circle is, well, one thing is clear. It should be some linear function that describes the x-coordinate of that center. We did say that this circle was rolling at a constant speed. And so if we take a look at it for a minute, when the wheel makes one full turn, how far does it actually roll? Well, in one full turn, the linear speed of that wheel is the circumference over the time. We know the circumference is how far the wheel actually moved because the circumference of the circle is the part that's rolling around or rolling along the ground. So from 0 to 2 pi, how far does this wheel go? Well, it goes the circumference, which in this case would be 2 pi times r over the time, which is 2 pi. So actually, what is the constant rate of travel of the center of this circle, it's two units per whatever unit of time we're measuring this in. All right, now that means if t was time and I started at a position of zero for the center of that circle, so remember here was our circle starting at the origin. So what's going to happen to the center of the circle? It's going to move at a constant speed to the right as the wheel turns and it's going to do, do so linearly at a constant speed. The speed is 2, and if time is running at a constant rate from 0 to 2 pi, the location, the x-coordinate of the location of the center of that circle should be 2t. So I'm going to say the center of that circle should be at 2t comma 2. All right, that's the center. Now let's go back and look at the applet one more time. Okay, let's play it again. Okay, watch the actual circle. And of course, if I watch that radius turning around and around, I realize that it actually starts at the bottom. And so now keep your eye on the red dot. I can see that that red dot is just tracing out a circle. It starts down at 3 pi over 2. It turns clockwise. And of course, it makes one full rotation in 2 pi units of time. All right, now, that should remind us of something we talked about the other day. We looked at several different parameterizations of circles. We talked about the standard one, sort of the standard trip parameterization, which is the one that says x equals cosine t, y equals sine t, t goes from 0 to 2 pi, and we said that was the one that starts us at 1, 0 and traces out the curve one full rotation of the circle from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, then we looked at a couple of other examples. 
we looked at how we could change the argument of these cosine and sine functions to make the curve be traced out slower or faster. Okay, but we also looked at an example x equals sine t, y equals cosine t. And if you recall with that one, now let's see, when you plug 0 into both of these, this one gives you 0 and this one gives you 1, which means we were starting at this point. And when we actually made a table, we figured out that this would give us clockwise rotation. Sorry, this one up here was counterclockwise. This one's clockwise. Clockwise rotation starting at 0, 1. Okay, notice back in our applet one more time. When I play this, that's definitely what's happening in our picture. If you watch the red dot, it's simply traveling around a circle of radius 2 at a constant speed. So really what I need, if I'm going to write equations for what's happening to that dot in terms of viewing it as a point traveling around a circle clockwise, I think the only thing we need to do is change where this point starts. I don't want it to start there. I want it to start down here. Okay, notice in our picture, the wheel is here. The point we're following doesn't start there. It starts here. All right, now, you should realize that the only change I have to make to these equations to make that happen that is to these two because they definitely have me going the right way. I'm going clockwise. I just need to shift them. Actually what I need to do is shift them back by pi. Okay, notice if I plug in t equals zero, this one would be sine of negative pi, which is zero. This one would be cosine of negative pi, which is negative 1. That would put me at 0, negative 1. That would put me here. I know having the sine for the x and the cosine for the y gives me the clockwise rotation I want. Okay, these are the correct equations. Now we can actually simplify those a little bit. Uh, let's use our old identities for the sum or the sine of a sum or a difference and the cosine of a sum or a difference. I know that in this x, if I have sine of t minus pi, that would just be sine t cosine pi minus sine pi cosine t. Of course, I know sine of pi is 0, and I know cosine of pi is negative 1. So that means x would just be negative sine t, which is what I have right there. Okay, what about y? Same sort of analysis. It would be cosine of t, cosine of pi, plus sine t, sine pi. Okay, again, sine of pi is 0, so that part's gone. And cosine of pi is negative 1, so that means y would be negative 1 times cosine t. It would be negative cosine t. All right, let's put this all together now. If I think about the center of the circle and what it's doing, I know that I can track the position of the center of that moving circle with the coordinates 2t, 2. Okay, what about the point on the circle that we're following? Well, it looks like I can track that. And here I'll, I'll write this... Uh, this way instead just to emphasize we're saying x is equal to 2t and we're saying y is held constant at 2. That's for just the center point. For the point on the circle, the one that's going round and round, I think what we're saying is x equals negative sine t and y equals negative cosine t. Now there is one other thing here. Uh, we do need to multiply these functions by the radius of the circle. And so in that case, I would get x equals negative 2 sine t and y equals negative 2 cosine t. So x equals negative 
to sine t, y equals negative 2 cosine t. All right, now, one last question. Um, this gets me, these equations get me the coordinates of the center of the circle. Now, let's be careful. What do these equations give me? They give me the position of that point as it moves around that circle, but relative to the center of the circle. Okay, but I don't want equations that track the position of that point as it moves around the circle relative to the center of that circle. I want them relative to the origin, relative to 0, 0. Okay, so I'm going to write this down and I'll let you think about it a little bit. My claim is that if I want the x-coordinate of that point moving around that circle relative to 0, 0, then what I need to do is first move to the center, which would put me at 2t, and then I need to add the x-coordinate of this little triangle. So let's say I've moved the circle to a certain position, and I'm at a certain 2t comma 2 here for some value of t. How am I going to get from there out to this point? Well, to that x-coordinate, I just need to add whatever this is, which in this case would be a negative value. In other words, I would subtract something from 2t to get this x-coordinate, whatever that x-coordinate is. And then how would I get to this position up here with my y-coordinate? I would add something to 2. I would add this amount. All right, so my claim is that the correct equation for the x should be 2t plus a negative 2 sine t. Or in other words, 2t minus 2 sine t. And my y should be this y-coordinate of 2 plus whatever this y-coordinate is right here that would get me up to that point on the circle. Now, of course, realize negative 2 cosine t is going to change signs. Sometimes it's going to be negative, sometimes it's going to be positive. Uh, notice that when the circle first starts turning, your t is between 0 and pi over 2 which means cosine and sine are both positive, in which case you will be subtracting something from your center. And I'll pull the picture up here again one more time to show you that. So of course I'm going to take 2 minus 2 cosine t. And if you notice, uh, I could write that as 2 times t minus sine t, where notice that that 2 is actually just the radius of the circle, and I could write the y equation as 2 times 1 minus cosine t. Notice that in my applet, those are the equations I have up there at the top. And if I reset this and let it spin just a little bit, okay, that'll be good. Let's stop right there. So what I meant a minute ago is when the, the circle begins to turn, this t angle you see right here is between 0 and pi over 2. And do you see that to get to that red dot, you're going to have to first move from the origin out to the center of the circle. And then once you've reached the center of the circle, you're going to have to subtract something from the x-coordinate and subtract something from the y-coordinate to get yourself down to that red dot. Well, that's fine because when you look at our equations, these guys right here, when t is between 0 and pi over 2, I will definitely be subtracting something in both cases from the 2t and the 2. But as I move around the circle, the signs of these two will change signs. Sometimes they'll both be positive, sometimes both negative sometimes one positive and the other negative. All right, so what we've done here is just sort of walk through how I can break this picture apart to figure out some parametric equations for this cycloid. 
And again, why this cycloid is the solution to those two famous physics problems is another class and a different story, but it's uh, worth mentioning at least that this is a very famous curve that you're going to see again in physics. Um, I will say one more thing. Uh, why, aside from the fact that constructing this seemed very easy when we were using parametric equations, the other question would be, why don't I just talk about this with rectangular equations? And the answer to that is that the rectangular equation for the cycloid looks something like this. It's a sine inverse of square root 2ay minus y squared all over a equals the square root of 2ay minus y squared plus x. Um, and obviously that's a pretty nasty looking equation and definitely one that I'll tell you uh, cannot be solved for y explicitly in terms of x uh, by hand algebraically. Um, even if it could be, it, it certainly would probably be pretty pretty weird formula, but uh, it turns out actually it can't be solved for y in terms of x. So think about the difference here. This is very complicated versus these functions which are very simple. And it turns out there are a lot of other curves like this that we'll look at in say Calc 3 and you'll look at in physics which are much simpler to describe in terms of parametric equations. In fact in the next section we'll see that same thing come up again. So while this may take a little, get, a little getting used to, this describing uh, graphs of functions in terms of these parametric equations, once you get the hang of it, it actually does make a lot of curves much easier to deal with. Okay, we'll stop there.